In real life, I'm Ralph Nelson, a resident of the Forest of Duke. For today's reading, I shall put on my tricorn hat to portray my patriot ancestor. I put my hat on. I am the ghost of Joseph Cheeseman, born in 1744 in East Hempstead, Long Island. I learned the trade of masonry, and I didn't like Parliament's meddling. In April of 1775, fighting broke out at Lexington and Concord in Massachusetts. My second cousin, Jacob Cheeseman, joined the 1st New York Regiment and became a captain. His regiment went to Canada to dislodge the British there. Jacob died in the attack on Quebec City on December 31st, New Year's Eve. In March of 1776, the British were driven out of Massachusetts. Many states started recruiting militia, fearing invasion. I joined Malcolm's levy of militia as a first lieutenant. In August, the British invaded New York City and my family fled north. Malcolm's levy withdrew to a defensive line north of the city. With no firemen left to stop a fire, the western half of the city burned down. I participated in the battle at White Plains, which the British won. We then made a strategic withdrawal north to the Peekskill area. Good craftsmen were needed to build fortifications at West Point. I was assigned to be director of masons at West Point. After six more years of cold winters, the war ended. I and my family returned to New York City, and I was successful as a builder. My wife, Kay, made the uniform that I was wearing, as shown on the first slide, as many colonial wives did during the American Revolution. Why do people come here? Why do we celebrate the 4th of July? Sometimes we enjoy the day with a family picnic, and that's good. One purpose of the Declaration of Independence was to free us to enjoy life. And uh, this is the slide for that, which I skipped by. Now, why do people come from, from all over the world to the United States? Well, there are a lot of reasons that are based in great part on the Declaration of Independence. Abraham Lincoln said it well in his, dec his Gettysburg Address. Four score and seven years ago, our forefathers brought forth on this land a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Oppressive, oppression, when there is no effective representation, takes many forms. Your social group may not be allowed to enter certain trades. Your social group may be denied schooling or cannot worship openly. Your social group may not be allowed to own land. You may have good credentials and abilities, but be denied a job or advancement because you don't have friends in the power structure that controls the organization. In my childhood, after reading the Bible verse for the day, we recited, recited the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag and to the republic, which the flag represents. We don't pledge to some person who thinks he's a king, but acts like the devil. The flag is a visible symbol for the Declaration of Independence. Our pledge reaffirms our commitment to liberty and justice for all. How are the lives of colonists in 1770 constrained compared to their relatives in Great Britain? The British concept of colonial management was based on mercantilism a process of maximizing profits from land claimed for the king far from the motherland. The principles were to extract resources, for example, importing crops, trees, and ore at low cost to the motherland, to deny colonial manufacturing, which would have competed with the motherland, to export finished goods to the colonies at a decent profit, to deny trade with other nations, again to prevent competition with the mother country, to deny access to military training so as to prevent rebellion, to deny representation in parliament 
to stifle any resistance that there might be in the colonies, and to require payments in pounds sterling, again to stifle smuggling, which would have resulted in money that was, say, French francs, rather than English pounds. So you will not accept the French francs as payment. Furthermore, the whole continent had been claimed by and is being distributed by the king, while colonial charters gave settlement rights to the colonists all the way to the Pacific Ocean, this could be changed simply by a royal proclamation, as it was in 1763. This was, of course, similar to land rights in Great Britain, where to this day, the king holds legal title to nearly the entire coastline. How did resentment in the colonies gradually grow to become resistance? This is a 20-year timeline for the major events and the breakdown in relations between Britain and its colonies. At the Albany Congress in 1754, representatives from seven states met to develop a united agreement with the Iroquois Confederation of Native Nations. It initiated communication between the colonies and served as a model for later gatherings. Ben Franklin developed a graphic to encourage unity which you see in the upper right-hand corner. The French and Indian War raged worldwide from 1754 to 1763. That war ended with a treaty giving Great Britain control over formerly French land in North America. In October of 1763, King George proclaimed that, that the land west of the Appalachian crest line would be an Indian reserve, no longer available for colonial settlement. These maps show how the colonial charters, which originally had western boundaries at the Pacific Ocean, were suddenly limited to the crest line of the Appalachian Mountains. This crushed the colonists' hopes for utilizing western lands for their children. The colonists paid only local taxes, going back to the earlier timeline. These taxes were used to build local roads and to pay for local government and judiciary costs. They were not to pay for a large army and navy for international warfare. Parliament decided it should tax the American colonists to help pay for the war debt. The Stamp Act of 1765 was, first, was the first tax levied by Parliament on colonists. The colonists resisted paying the stamp tax, and it was repealed. The Revenue Act of 1767 was designed to exert more control over the colonies by taxing the American colonists both to help pay off the war debt and to allow Parliament to pay the colonial governors and judges directly rather than having the colonial legislatures pay for them out of local taxes. Thus, colonial assemblies would have little income and little influence. In October 1768, British troops started arriving in Boston to maintain order. That was the ostensible reason. There were not enough barracks for them, so they were quartered in local homes. That meant that people had to accept soldiers sleeping and eating with them without paying for it. This led to constant harassment of the troops by the colonists. In March of 1770, there was a deadly response by the troops which was later called the Boston Massacre. It killed five colonists. Tea from Dutch Caribbean islands was cheaper than English tea, so colonists smuggled in twice as much tea as they bought from Britain. The 1773 Tea Act gave the East India Company a monopoly on sales in the colonies. In addition, Britain increased enforcement and penalties to prevent smuggling. These changes hurt both the colonial legal and contraband tea merchants. So everyone was against the tea tax. In December of 1773, the Boston Tea Party threw tons of tea into the harbor, depriving Britain of income from the Tea Act. Other states had similar incidents. The British response was to pass the Boston Port Act, these closed the port of Boston in March of 1774. Events quickly 
Sorry about that. Events quickly deteriorated into organized hostility. This timeline is for only 15 months. In October of 1774, Congress passed the Articles of Association, saying that if the Boston Port Tax Acts were not repealed by December 1st of 1774, the colonies would start a boycott of British goods. The acts were not repealed, and the colonists started stockpiling weapons. Here are some illustrations to help you visualize those activities. In April of 1775, British troops left Boston to look for hidden weapons. Minutemen and militias were warned and marched to the area. The British confronted militia at Lexington, killing several. Other militias arrived and beat the British back to Concord. The British then fought their way back to Boston, where they were besieged. A month later, colonial troops captured Fort Ticonderoga without firing a shot. Two columns of colonial militia traveled through winter snow to attack the walls of Quebec on New Year's Eve, but they failed to take it. The colonists knew that the cannon captured at Fort Ticonderoga would dominate the British troops in Boston and in nearby harbors, so they moved the cannon, shot, and powder 260 miles to Boston in midwinter. Fourteen days later, the British boarded ships and left Boston on March 17th. Everyone knew that the British would return elsewhere in great force to try and cut the New England states off from the other states. General Washington called on all available forces to gather in New York City. On June 10th of 1776, the Colonial Congress appointed a committee of five chaired by Thomas Jefferson to write a Declaration of Independence. In the five days after that was submitted, Congress deleted 25% of the text. On July 2nd, a large British fleet arrived at New York Harbor and placed 9,000 soldiers on Staten Island. On July 4th, the delegates to the Continental Congress voted to adopt the Declaration of Independence. This declaration was the official start of seven years of war, which caused significant death, injury, destruction, hunger, and despair, affecting virtually every household in the colonies. In August, the British ferried their troops to Long Island for the Battle of Brooklyn, the first and one of the largest battles of the war. The British won here. Time is short, so I'll simply summarize the Declaration of Independence. It is comprised of four parts. Number one was the Declaration of Inalienable Rights. It is now necessary for our people to assume the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitle them. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The second part was to note the many grievous acts of the king acting through parliament. After a long train of abuses and usurpations, it is our right, it is our duty to throw off such government. What has the king done? He's wrecked our colonial system of government, restricted immigration and land grants, prohibited migration westward, ordered troops in our homes, and taxed us without representation. Third part was to declare national independence. First noting, we petitioned the king for redress, but we received only injury. Secondly, we appealed to our British brethren, but we were disregarded. In spite of that, we hold them to be enemies in war, but in peace, friends. And went on to declare, we therefore solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are, and of right ought to be, 
free and independent states. The last part was to express total commitment. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledged to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. By signing this declaration, the delegates understood that they could be hanged for treason if captured. And in fact, several of them were captured, but they were not hanged because we'd captured some high-ranking British officers and they were traded um, rather than hanged. Well, why write such a long document? What was the purpose of all this? Why not just fight it out? Well, a number of reasons. First was to provide a clear description of the problem. <laughs> Many people here and abroad would read it in their newspapers, and by writing it out themselves, they avoided the issue of having some um, editor in France deciding what this thing was all about and perhaps describing it incorrectly. Secondly, it was to convince those who were dubious with well-phrased arguments. For example, the long list of abuses. Third was to give soldiers and activists pride and hope. This would serve them well during the hard times that were going to come in the coming years. Also to present our case to potential international supporters, possibly France or Holland or Spain, and certainly to supporters in Great Britain. And also to remind the leaders of the revolution and to keep them on track for liberty rather than going off and fighting for other causes instead. We're trying to make personal gain out of the revolution. And lastly, to enlighten descendants, to inform descendants of the patriots and also of more recent immigrants about what the new nation struggled for fought for, and eventually won. That ends my summary of the declaration, but we have a bit more. And um, as we know, <coughs> many acts have occurred in North America violating the self-evident rights of people who were created equal, to take some words from the declaration. The most obvious categories for such acts are dispossessing people to secure very valuable assets and farmland so as to feed unchecked population growth, um, enslaving people and encouraging immigration so as to secure inexpensive labor to maximize the wealth that you could get from mines and farmland and later from city factories, using force to acquire non-voting colonies or buffer states, creating political structures and procedures that prevent lower class people from having any power that might reduce the assets or influence of the wealthy. When such actions happened before 1776, they could be blamed on the monarchs of Spain, France, and Great Britain, since it was their charters, their policies, and their armies that invaded a land of many Amerindian tribes obtained their land through often unfair practices and decimated their populations through disease and warfare. The initial colonization of the east coast of North America was simply another example of how humans had interacted for the previous 5,000 years. Such acts that happened after 1776 were committed by US leaders who were elected by majorities of those who voted or through unfair practices that the voters did not stop. So, the U.S. frontier rolled westward over what little opposition could be mustered by the native residents, just as they themselves, the native residents, had gotten the land by overwhelming previous inhabitants, enslaving them and appropriating their land. For the native people, the declaration produced only a new enemy. Many bad actions have diminished our national image. Other revolutions that were inspired by the Declaration of Independence ended up producing dictatorships. States' rights were debated for a considerable length of time, 
principally as to whether slavery would be continued or not, and eventually resulted in the Civil War, which killed hundreds of thousands of, of people. The Indians Clearance Acts and Indian Wars in the 1880s were another example of uh, making agreements, breaking agreements, and pushing people off the land. Many of the immigrants that came to the country were disenfranchised by changing the voting regulations so that they were unable to vote. There was a lot of labor unrest once cities started and unions formed to protect the rights of laborers, laborers and uh, they were met with military suppression in some cases. A number of countries or lands that had people that were not particularly interested in being part of the United States um, were taken over by the United States and served as territories or in the case of Hawaii eventually becoming a state. That's Cuba, Puerto Rico, the Philippines, Panama, and of course Hawaii. Then there has been extensive gerrymandering and tests for voting rights that have disenfranchised people from voting. And lastly, we have a lack of oversight of self-serving activities has been permitted to continue. No laws passed against it, um, well, some laws passed against it. For, for example, gifts to the president, stock trades made by congressmen who have advanced knowledge of laws that will affect the value of the stocks, and very good friends of the Supreme Court that uh, provide um, surprisingly valuable um, friendship gifts to Supreme Court judges. Well, in contrast, we can point with pride to a number of things that have happened that are positive, due in good part to the Declaration of Independence. First of all, um, you look around the world now, you find many fewer kings than there used to be, and the autocrats that are presently leading countries are usually held in poor regard by the rest of the world. Also, the US serves as a model for the United Nations um, NATO and the European Union. We developed a stock market, Hollywood, Broadway, and popular music that are the envy of the world and widely copied around the world. Have large numbers of people who are seeking green cards, student visas, and work visas in order to come here. We developed means of personal interaction worldwide that have been copied and used all over the world. The laws, regulations, and judgments that have been made in the United States very frequently support individual rights and help people lead happier lives. We have international cooperation with many other countries on many items as represented by the International Space Station. And we have leaders of international businesses, technical societies. And lastly, of course, we have a lot of people coming here as tourists and a large number of people coming here as illegal immigrants. So in conclusion, I would say independence. Was it a declaration or a deception? Well, as long as we have the right to vote and to speak out and we have the courage to exercise those rights, we can move toward the declaration's goal of happiness. Thank you. Are there any questions?